When you go into a forest, there are three kinds of things in the forest. There are the things that are obviously there, things that are obviously not there, and then there are things that are there but they're not so obvious. But the obvious things, no matter what you're looking for, no matter how you're looking, you're going to see them. Like the trees. The trees are everywhere. But things that are not there, like say a black hole, no matter what you're looking for, no matter how you're looking, you're not going to find it. But there are certain kinds of mushrooms that you're going to find only if you look in the right way, or your chances for finding them are much improved if you're looking in the right way and if you know what you're looking for. This is a good image to keep in mind, because what we're looking for in terms of getting the mind to settle down in concentration and taking that concentration even further belongs in that third category. So if we're not finding concentration, we should ask ourselves, well, what am I looking for and how am I looking? Think of the Buddha on his path, looking for awakening. As he said, he was seeking the sublime state of unexcelled peace. That's what he was looking for, and the way he looked for it was to look for what is skillful. In other words, he was assuming the principle of cause and effect, and the important causes were in his mind, coming from inside. His own actions, those were the things that would be skillful or not. So when he found himself at a dead end, he would stop and ask, okay, this is obviously not the peace he was looking for. So he turned around and looked at his actions, reflected on what he was doing, and tried to find something better, a new way of acting. So when your meditation is not going well, it doesn't help much to blame things outside. There are circumstances they make it difficult, but sometimes we can get obsessed. Things are good enough, and yet they're not good enough for us. We kind of get obsessed about what someone else is doing, noises, this, that, or the other thing outside. But it's really beside the point. You have to keep looking back inside, inside. And remember the Buddha's instructions. How do you get the mind into concentration? You do it by practicing right mindfulness, establishing mindfulness. There's a passage where the Buddha pretty much equates his description of establishing mindfulness with the first jhana. He describes the basic formula for right mindfulness. And then once the mind is settled in, then he says, to be focused on, say, the body in and of itself, but don't think any thoughts related to the body. In other words, you drop direct a thought and evaluation. And that's here again the second jhana, which implies that in the establishing of mindfulness there's going to be direct a thought and evaluation. And that's not described in the formula. But John Lee was reflective enough, and this shows that he was going about things in the right way, doing the concentration and reflecting on it, reflecting on his own actions. And he saw that those pieces of the formula, keeping the mind focused on something in and of itself, putting aside greed and distressful preference to the world, being ardent, alert, and mindful, those were equivalent to the different factors of the first jhana.
of those three qualities, the wisdom quality is ardency. Mindfulness is defined simply as being able to remember things done a long time ago, things said a long time ago, which can be perfectly neutral. You can remember skillful things, you can remember unskillful things. And at that point, simply being mindful on its own doesn't make the distinction. The same with ardency. Ardency is being aware of what's happening, what you're doing, results of what you're doing. And again, it can be skillful actions, unskillful actions. You can be perfectly alert doing some very unskillful things, but it still counts as alertness, according to the definition. It's in the ardency where the distinction between skillful and unskillful becomes important. You're ardent to abandon what is unskillful. You're ardent to develop what is skillful. That fits in with the Buddha's way of looking for the unexcelled state of peace. Search for what is skillful. So the valuation in the factor of jhana, that's the factor that's very much concerned with what's skillful and what's not. It's the process of trying to get the mind to be snugly with the object. And if things are not going well, well you look at what you're doing. You look at the mind states that you're bringing, as they would often say, make a survey of your mind as you're sitting down to meditate. Is it leaning forward? Is it leaning back? Is it leaning to the left, to the right? Forward, of course, is your thoughts are headed to the future, back, you're headed to the past. Left and right is to things that you're pleased with or displeased with. And if you see it's leaning in any of those directions, you try to straighten it out. There's an implication here in Thai you may not get in English, which is the word leaning in Thai. is related to the word for bias, akate. Your mind is headed in the wrong direction, biased towards what it likes, biased against what it doesn't like, biased because of fear, biased because of delusion. You try to straighten these things out. You think in ways. And straighten them out. This is all part of the evaluation. Then you look at the breath. This is where John Lee gives lots of recommendations for evaluating the length of the breath, the quality of the breath, evaluating once you get a sense of pleasure out of the breath, how you can make the most of it, spreading it through the body, evaluating how you can maintain that full body awareness. This is in line with the passage in the canon where you're spreading feelings of rapture and pleasure throughout the body. And of course, you're directing your thoughts to the breath, to the state of the mind, as you evaluate them. So this engages ardency, alertness, mindfulness all together. And as long as you have to think about the breath so that you're not thinking about anything else, you maintain these factors. Because you know that if you're not thinking about the breath, you'll start thinking about something else. If you're not evaluating the breath, you'll be evaluating something else. Outside of the meditation, you will have lost your focus. So the part of the wall that protects your concentration, protects the singleness of your focus, that part of keeping the breath in mind, keeping focused on the breath in and of itself. And right there you've got all the causal factors of the first jhana. And you begin to notice, yes, there is a sense of fullness and refreshment. There is a sense of ease and pleasure. What notices? Alertness and evaluation. The alertness is there in the evaluation, just as the ardency is in the evaluation. And the ardency is in the directed thought. But as you keep observing what's going on, you begin to notice that you don't have to think so much about the breath. You don't have to evaluate it so much. Everything is going well inside. You've got everything 
saturated with sense of well-being. There may be little pains here and there, but the predominant sensation throughout the body is one of ease, fullness, refreshment. Then as your last active evaluation before you leave the first jhana, you realize you don't have to keep on evaluating, you don't have to keep on directing your thoughts, you can drop that. You're just there, one with the breath, one with the whole body. Awareness filling the body, breath filling the body. And you're mindful to maintain that. Now, this doesn't mean that alertness and ardency go away. They just change their roles. Now the ardency is to be fully focused, maintain that sense of center, but broad awareness without gap. And the alertness keeps watch. There's still a thought in mind. At this point, it's a perception, just breath, breath, breath. You're not thinking in full sentences anymore. But those three qualities of mindfulness are still there. Ardency, alertness, mindfulness. Simply that they've changed their role. Because as you've evaluated, they're no longer necessary. If you find yourself sl slipping out of that focus, you may have to go back to evaluate the breath again. But these three factors that are mentioned in the formula for right mindfulness, those carry all the way through, all the way through states of concentration. Simply that they change their roles as you go from one to the next. So when we're being mindful, it's not simply a matter of being aware of whatever is happening. We're directing things toward an unexcelled state of peace. Even though concentration itself is not that state of peace, it's the path there. It's in the right direction. And you're doing it all along by looking for what's skillful. If things are not going well, you turn around and look at what you're doing. And when they are going well, you maintain them. Keep watch over what you're doing. And when you take responsibility for your practice like this, that's when you're going to get to see things that are not so obvious. So mindfulness does have its agendas. The way the Buddha defines it, it's specifically mindfulness for the sake of concentration, concentration for the sake of discernment. Discernment for the sake of release. But none of these things are obvious. Which is why you have to be very careful about what you're looking for and how you're looking. And if you follow the Buddha's example, you're headed in the right direction. <laughs>